Okay, so just to finish off a couple outstanding issues from this step two code, I have that code open here. Uh, and right at the bottom, notice I added changes to make. Issue is related to, remember at the very end, what we did is we added that consolidated code to provide the select list for our drop downs, right? And we modified the code in the view for the drop down a little bit. So let me bring the project over as well. Right, so inside our create view for the patient, right, here was where we have our select or our lookup for the doctor where we can specify the doctor. Well, we saw that we could add a, our own hard-coded option into the select, right? So that would appear at the top. So we can say select a doctor and force them to actually pick a doctor out of the list, right? That's a better design for creating a new record because if you have one of the doctors pre-selected, believe me, if you leave it, open for uh, a data entry person, a user to make a mistake, they'll find a way to do it, right? Experience taught me that very quickly <laughs> in this field. So if you just have a default doctor selected, they're gonna get 99% of the patients. Well, maybe not that many, but you know, quite often it'll just be that they forgot to select the actual doctor and there was one selected already. So that's why it's good to put an option in like this, but something that wasn't in the uh, scaffolded code is a spot to put a validation error message, right? Because the way it was set up, you can't go wrong. There will always be a doctor selected, right? So there's no need for validation. You can't create a record for a patient without having a doctor selected. But because we added this option here, now you could click the submit button before you've actually selected a doctor. So that's just a little problem with how we left the code last time. So there's a quick fix for that, right? Basically, we just need one of these validations. Right? This is a, a, a span tag here, ASP validation for the field in the model, right? So when the system takes the validation error message, adds it to the model state, basically for the given property, it comes back to the view here and will be automatically displayed. That's how those data annotations, the error messages we create, get to the view. So that's what we're missing here. So just to show you from the copy paste file, right? What we need to do is add a span here where the ASP validation is for doctor ID, right? So I can just copy that out of here. I don't need the whole code block because everything else is fine. Uh, so right under the select, I'll just throw in this new span tag here so that I have a validation message for doctor ID. Remember, doctor ID is the actual uh, property that we're updating, the foreign key property. Okay, well, that's part of it, but, you know, then I noticed that uh, we needed to make a little bit of a change to the annotation for this foreign key value within the patient class. So that's noted here inside our text file as well, right? To get a friendly error message if no doctor is selected, we don't really need the required attribute. But what we could do is add a range attribute instead, right? Because this is a bit of a change with going to .NET Core. Before... With something like this, we would get null as the value if they had selected doctor. Now I notice we get zero. I'm not sure exactly where that change happened, but we get zero. So to handle that then, if our select a doctor option is the, pre, is the one currently selected, best way to do it is just come back to our patient model, way down here to the foreign key. Okay, don't worry about the, it's all just because I haven't run it yet, so there's all the blood everywhere, right? So here's our foreign key, the int for doctor ID. I don't really need this required message. What I need is a, a range because it'll give me a zero. And of course, all the other integer ID values for the doctors will be a, an integer greater than zero, one, two, three, four, whatever, right? I can just use the range annotation here saying the minimum is one. Now, here's a little bit of an interesting point to talk about. You know, there's no compare, right? So we can't just say it's got to be greater than this. So we always have to have a range with both a max and a minimum value. So since it's an integer, instead of going and looking up in the help system, what's the biggest integer I can allow? Fortunately, C Sharp has nice little properties here for the data types like int dot max value, right? So in other words, anything from one up to the maximum value of the data type integer, I'll accept any of those answers. Mm -hmm. In other words, I won't accept zero, <laughs> right? So if it's still on the prompt at the top of the drop-down list, select a doctor, you're going to get zero, 
and then now I'll get a proper error message. So that's just a little bit of tidy up at the end of our last uh, segment of working on this project together. So let me run it now. See how this goes. Do, 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 do. It took a little while this time because I had to build, right? And actually had to create the database and so on and so forth. So now if I go to patients, okay, if I click create new, and along with all the other messages now, of course, we have our selected doctor, right? That's the top option here. That's the one we hard-coded in with an option tag inside the select. The rest of the data, notice it's got right away, okay? You must select a primary care physician. So along with all the other feedback messages we're getting for our validation annotations, now we're getting one here for the uh, drop-down list. We must select a doctor, basically, the primary care physician of the patient. Okay, so that was just a, to wrap that up. I'm not going to go through and actually add a doctor right now. It's just an awful lot of typing. Okay, I was kind of hoping my red would go away. Sometimes clean and build works. If not, just closing Visual Studio and opening it again will get rid of all the blood on the screen. I could be patient or I could just open it again. Any questions about that? That's a, just a little thing left over that I realized I had not put a validation control there. There used to be one with the old system, but we had to just make a little change there. All right, good. Now my blood is gone. Okay, so we'll come back to that in a second. So that was all we had left from step two. That was outstanding. So I want to go on now and talk about many-to-many. -many. So far, all the relationships we've looked at have been one-to-many relationships, right? So my little PowerPoint here is good for reviewing that and uh, as well as introducing the new many-to-many -many relationship. And it's not new to us, but it's new to us doing it with code first in .NET Core. Okay, so let me start the slideshow for our discussion. So actually, I'm going to build up and add more to this as we go on. So basically, this will be a summary of how we create all the different relationships we need to in our POCO classes, our plain old CLR object classes, right? Because after all, families come in all sizes and shapes, right? Okay. So just going through this, the basic assumption is that most entities will have an integer primary key named ID, right? It just makes it easier. I don't have to keep repeating that in each slide. And just a, a change with .NET Core that caught me by surprise. Uh, I hadn't realized because I, you know, sometimes you see something and you're so used to seeing it all the time, you don't realize you don't need it anymore. That virtual keyword. Remember I said that when we create these navigation properties, we, we say virtual, so they can be overridden. Well, with the new uh, .NET Core, we don't have to say virtual anymore. Any framework core can override them without having to say that keyword. It doesn't hurt, so if you have it there, it's not a problem. You don't have to remove it, but going forward, I won't be using that virtual keyword. I guess the advantage is if you're ever going to copy-paste code, because most of it's compatible going back and forth between .NET Framework then it would still work in .NET Framework, but yeah, whatever. Okay, all right. So one to many. Just to review, this is what we've done, and now that you're going to have to start creating your own classes, it's good uh, time to review it anyway. There's two scenarios where the parent is required. In other words, the uh, child can't exist without a parent record. That's the normal or most common scenario, right? So basically what we do is we have some parent. In my example here, we talk about province and city, right? Province has many cities, the city is in one province. Okay? So to do that in the classes, first thing we do is in the city class, right, we have the public province province. Don't have to say virtual anymore. Right? And that actually is enough to establish the relationship, but for our convenience, we usually also add the foreign key value. Now because, as I said at the beginning, our assumption is everything has an int identity primary key, it would be an integer. And the naming convention we can follow is the parent class province ID, right? That way we don't have to put an annotation on there to say that it's a foreign key by following the naming convention. But along with that, we can also, in the parent object, add a collection, an I collection of the child object class, right? So we can actually carry around and eagerly load, that's what it's for, okay? 
You like that? Was that good? Hey, come on, cheer me on a little bit here. That was a lot of work. <laughs> that's our op allows option that we can do a dot include. So when we do a link query to pull out all the provinces, we can say dot include city, and then away we go. We get all the cities along with them, right? Okay. So that's basically what we've done already. Just good to review it because you're going to have to create a whole bunch of classes that are one to many relationships. So now you know uh, in succinctly how to put them together. Now the other option is what if the parent is optional, right? So think department employee, for example, for a moment, right? A department has many employees and employees in one department, but sometimes you might have a floater, right? An employee who's not assigned to any one department. Okay, maybe they go around, they spend the morning working in uh, one department, the afternoon working somewhere else, wherever they're needed most. Right? So how do you handle that? Well, you can see the key is right there, the question mark after the data type int. Right? That's really all it takes. It's saying it's a nullable foreign key. So because uh, the object itself is always nullable, right? as objects usually are. So we don't have to have a department object in here. In fact. Usually we don't, unless we do a dot include or something like that, right? Uh, but the uh, integer can't be left null unless we make it a nullable int. And that allows the parent optional approach, right? We can still have our collection of uh, employees, okay, the child object inside the parent. The only thing that really changes is that. Uh, Entity Framework Core is smart enough that when it sees this arrangement, it will automatically do a different cascade arrangement too. So if you delete a department, Instead of deleting employees like it normally might want to do with cascade delete, it actually sets all these foreign keys to null. Right? It's smart enough to do that already. Okay, so those are two variations of the one to many. Pretty much the kind of thing we've done over and over again already. Right? Woo! I'm just showing off the uh, nullable int there. That's the focus of it. So let's talk about many to many. Right? Uh, this is a big change from any framework uh, version of this tool and uh, the .NET framework version because you could actually really cheat the system. You could actually put a collection and if you had student it takes many courses and of course as many students you can actually just put a collection of courses in student and a collection of student in courses and you don't have to in your code in your model even mention an intersection entity. right? That's a real shortcut that was available as long as you didn't have any payload. In other words, any extra fields to track inside that intersection entity. It still would in the database because you can't in a relational database have a many-to-many -many without an intersection table. Right? So it was still created in the background, but you would never see it. You wouldn't have a DB set for it. You never had to worry about it. You could just refer to the opposite collection from each side of the many-to-many -many relationship. Can't do that yet in .NET Core. Right? So we have to make the intersection or associative entity visible, right? It has to have its own DB set, okay? And away we go with it. So it's really not different from how we learned with SQL in the first place. You always have to have that intersection entity. It's just a slightly different approach for those that have worked with the .NET framework before. All right, so basically this is what we have at the minimum. So no payload means there's no additional properties inside the intersection other than the ones necessary to relate the many-to-many -many relationship. So if we have a student in many courses and a course as many students, right, then that intersection table, by the way, the naming convention for an intersection table often is just a, a, a concatenation of the names of the two parents, right? So it could be student course or course student, either approach is fine. But what most de designers will tell you is if there's a more logical or representative name, by all means use it instead, right? So when you think about it, enrollment is probably a good name for this associative entity, right? Because a student is enrolled in a course, of course, as many students enroll, right? So there's nothing wrong with giving it a different name uh, if it's appropriate to do so. But what do we see in the intersection? Four, count them, four things, no more, no less, right? We have our two child objects, or parent objects, I should say, right? The student and the course. So public student, student, public course, course. And of course, going along with them, We've seen it's advantageous to also add uh, properties for the integer foreign key values, right? And that's all we put in there. Uh, the only thing is, the primary key, every entity must have a primary key. We have to actually construct that with that Fluent API. But it's not hard, right? 
So it does mean we have to do a little bit of work inside our override of on model creating in the DB context to get the primary key defined. Now the two parents can each have a collection of the intersection table, right? So that's a little different. As I said, with the .NET framework, I, I could, in student, I could put an actual I collection of course objects, and it would navigate right through the intersection and give me the courses directly available. Can't do that now, but I can include a collection of enrollment, but you'll see with the then include option that they've added to .NET Core, it's really not a problem. Okay, so the composite key for enrollment requires the Fluent API, right? Okay, so how does that look? So inside the DB context, we have to actually add a DB set for the enrollment for the intersection entity, right? No problem, we can do that. And then in the on model creating, all it really takes is a bit of code like this, right? Model builder entity, the actual name of the intersection entity, has a key, right? That's the primary key that consists of the two, okay, the student ID and the course ID put together. Right. So you just follow that pattern for the code that you write and you can create the composite key. Okay. Now just a note, in situations like this for the user interface where, uh, where it's just, uh, uh, there's no payload, it's just the fact that there is a relationship between the two, often we'll use something like checkboxes or parallel list boxes in the user interface, right? So, you know, there's uh, situations like where, I don't know, uh, the camper might, <laughs> at the camp, uh, select what are their favorite ice cream flavors. They can pick as many as they want, and you have check boxes for chocolate, vanilla, butterscotch, etc. And they just check off the ones they want, right? That's a classic many-to-many -many relationship that would fit into this paradigm, that uh, there's nothing really else to say other than it is one of their favorite ice creams, right? So just the relationship is enough, and this would do that perfectly. If you needed to rank them, say, you know, okay, which is your most favorite? Well, that involves storing extra information in the relationship, in the intersection table itself, maybe a ranking or something, right? Then you can't use checkboxes. The data structure we've done so far would still work, but you can't just use a checkbox because you have to be able to also fill in that additional piece of information. All right. Oh, also, the one other thing with many-to-many, -many, okay, Essentially, you've got two one-to-many relationships, right? We've known that from the very beginning when we learned this in SQL. Uh, so by default, this puts cascade delete on, right? So if you delete, in our case, a, a student, all the enrollment records for the student would get deleted as well. If you delete a course, all the enrollment records for that course would be deleted as well by cascade delete. What if you don't want okay, cascade delete on one side, right? You can easily do that. So we can restrict deleting. For example, we might say, okay, well, it makes sense. If you're deleting a student, they've left the school or whatever, right? Obviously, you'd probably want to clean up all the uh, enrollment records, right? Because the student's going to be gone, okay? That makes sense. You might want that in place. But you might want to say, well, no, if there's uh, enrollment records in a course, we probably want to protect the course from being deleted as long as there's students enrolled in the course, right? If there's enrollment records, no, we don't want cascade delete. We should be prevented from deleting a course. So that's a simple matter of adding a bit more code in the Fluent API, right? All we really wanted to say was that last line there on delete, the delete behavior is restrict, but we have to say all the other <laughs> bits of uh, code first in order to get to that point. So basically we're saying that the entity called enrollment has one course with many enrollments, uh, has a foreign key, is course ID. So we're just talking about the relationship on one side here, coming into the intersection table. But that gives us a way to say that we're going to restrict the on-delete behavior. And that way you would say that, okay, if you, you can't delete a course if there's any students enrolled. Right? Now, if you wanted both, you could do the same thing on the other side as well. And then you could never delete an enrollment record unless you open the <laughs> DB set directly and delete them there. Right? All right, so... Enough for now, let's see how uh, that works inside of our actual um, example. So what I thought I'd do, so I have a new code file here, right? It's up right in Blackboard with the uh, part three, step three, many to many, okay? So what we're gonna do here is I thought with our medical office, you know, you go to the doctor's office, you're a new patient, right? They give you that form to fill out, 
you know, a bit of your medical history and so on. And there's a million check boxes. Have you ever had, you know, mumps? Check. Measles? Check. And so on and so forth. Have you ever had a heart attack? Check. You know, <laughs> things like that. Now, we, I know that uh, many of those actually ask you to give some history or talk about it, but just think of check boxes for a minute. We'll keep it simple, right? So let's say that our patient has a history of different conditions that they've had in the past. And we want to add that to the database, right? So here, that's an example. Then let me make my font bigger, because I can do that. Especially for those at the far side of the room, right? So what medical conditions have you had in the past? Patient medical history. So there's no payload. We aren't going to worry about tracking, you know, details about it, other than it's a check mark. Yes, they've had it in the past, right? You ever had measles? Things like that. So this will take a few changes. So the first one is we'll add. Uh, model f to hold all the different conditions. I, first name that popped into my head, we could use a different name if you really wanted to, but you know, a medical condition like, you know, I've had measles or mumps, right? Something like that. So we'll add this class to the models folder, okay? Public class, well actually I'll just get the content here. And we'll add that to the models class. So let me bring up Visual Studio. Okay, I'll clean up the screen a little bit, get some of this stuff off here. Okay, so coming over to the right in the models folder, I'll right click models and say add class. And the class will just be condition. Okay, and inside here, I'll just paste in my code. Now, of course, I'll get some red underlines in a moment, right? Uh, because I don't have the namespace for the component model data annotations, but I can just use my little helper here. See, he ran away on me. So control period always works using system component model data annotations. Okay. So the class is conditioned. By the way, you'll get it, you know, it, even with .NET Core, it's smart enough to complain if you make a property with the same name as the class. So condition name, right? Um, an ID for the integer identity primary key. And then notice I'm going to have a collection here of my intersection between patient and condition. I haven't created the class yet, so that's why it's underlining it. Okay? String length just is so I don't have a basically an nvarchar max inside the database. I make a nice nvarchar of 50 as a size. That's probably big enough for the name of any condition I'm going to add to the system. Okay, now along with that, I'll need another model, right, for patient condition. Uh, probably you just haven't closed Visual Studio and open it again after running. So I'll add another class called patient condition, right? So this is following that naming convention. This is an intersection between patient and condition, so I'll just call it patient condition. I could call it medical history, I, I suppose, but that's really not okay, that much more helpful, so I'm going to go with the default name. All right, so I have some code here as well, so my patient condition. Notice I don't even need any annotations because I don't plan on working directly uh, with this entity. Okay, It has to be there as a DB set so I can work through it, but I'll probably never make a controller right, where I'm just bringing up this information there's easier ways that I can actually work with the data. So I'm just going to copy the two foreign keys, essentially is all it contains, right, in patient condition. Now, as I said, the one thing it won't be able to tell from this is that you want a composite primary key made up of the two foreign keys. We'll have to use the Fluent API inside the uh, DB context in order to do that. We'll do that in a couple of seconds. But just before we finish adding stuff to the different models. Obviously, the patient model is something else we need to just add a little bit of stuff into our patient, right? So I'll come down near the bottom where I usually add extras, okay? Here's our foreign key to relate to the doctor. Uh, it could go above or below, it doesn't really matter. I'm gonna stick it here, but coming back to a notepad. We have to add a property to the patient model, right? We're gonna add our collection of patient conditions. I thought I'd throw a display name on here because, again, patient condition isn't really a very, you know, <laughs> user-friendly name to have appear on the screen anywhere. 
So if it ever has to show, I might as well just show it as history. Okay? Or medical history, but I like to keep things short if I can. Usually people working in a medical office know you're talking about the medical history. Right? Okay, so that's it for the new changes to the model. Right? I just have to now come to my DB context. So medical office context, open up that class. Right? So my two DB sets are there, but now I need two more. Right? So I could do it manually or do I have the code just to save time? Okay, yeah, I do. So I need a DB set for condition which I'll call plural conditions, and a DB set for my intersection table, okay, patient condition, and I'll call that in the plural form as well, patient conditions with an S on the end, right? So now I have all the DB sets I need to support the many-to-many -many relationship, even though I will likely do very little directly with patient conditions, I have to have a DB set so that I can uh, reference it in my dot include in my link query. Okay, now the other thing that uh, I kind of talked about in the PowerPoint is uh, we really don't want cascade delete on both sides of this relationship, right? Um, so we need to have the, the primary key, right? That's this much here. So I'll maybe add that next. So it can be anywhere underneath. I'll just paste that in, right? So the patient condition has a key made up of the condition ID and the patient ID. So now I have a primary key. If I had forgot to put that in place and added a migration, I would get an error message saying it could not identify a primary key for this entity. Right? So now it should be able to. And then the last thing I want to do inside the model with the model builder here in our override of on model creating is I really don't want Okay, if you delete a condition for delete all that medical history for that condition, because that's probably something you should get a warning message saying, oh, you can't delete, I don't know, uh, measles if there's a history of patients having measles. It makes sense on the other side, if a patient's leaving the medical clinic, yeah, then we would want to cascade delete, why keep their medical history, right? Have it delete all the intersection table records related to the patient. Yes, cascade delete on the one side, but no to cascade delete on the condition side. So if I try to delete a condition and there's patients with that condition in their history, I'll be told no. So I'll, that'll be the last thing I do here. And again, it's written in the same way where we just say the entity patient condition. Okay, this is all just the relationship that already exists, has one condition with many patient conditions, foreign key is condition ID, and there's the rub on delete, we're gonna restrict, okay? So we can't delete a condition that has a history with any patient. All right, so that's it. We're ready to do what? What would be the next logical thing? We've made changes to the model. Yeah, we, we need to do what? Well, we need to make sure the database is in sync with the model, right? So what do we add to update the database? using code first approach so that we can, the changes we've made to our model in general get written over to the database. What do we add? A migration, exactly, right? It's all about using migrations to keep the database in sync. Okay, so I don't know if I actually put code in here for the mic, no, I just said add migration and update database, right? Okay. So we'll do that next. So if I bring up my package manager console, right? Now again, save me a little bit here. I, I start <laughs> this one command so far in here. Uh, I'm just gonna grab that much out of it because really the IntelliSense helps me start the first part. Let me zoom for the other side of the room. All right, so I'm gonna add migration. Hitting tab should help complete that for me. Yeah, there we go. And that's my context is the medical office context. And maybe I'll just say many to many as a name for the uh, migration, right? Just so when I look at it, it can remind me at a glance. Oh, yeah, that's when I added the many to many, right? Oh, man to many. <laughs> 
Sorry, we don't want to. Yeah. Oh, come on, come on, fit. There we go. More or less. All right, so I'll just press enter. And that should, of course, it'll do, force a build first, right? Which I could have done myself to be safe, but there it is. So it built OK and added the migration. So we see, remember how migrations work? We have an up and a down. So to apply the migration, the up would be executed. So we'll create our new table for conditions, right? Has the primary key there. We'll create our table for patient conditions. This is kind of interesting. Notice, of course, we're still using our same schema, MO schema, for all of our tables in the uh, DB context. And it just has the two integers, okay? Our two columns, uh, nullable false integers, condition ID and patient ID, right? And then the primary key is made up of condition ID and patient ID. So it followed the uh, code that we put in the model builder with the model builder. So we have our composite primary key as well as, of course, we have our foreign keys, right? So they relate back to each of the parent entities on each side, but they use the combination of the two foreign keys as the primary key. And then it's just creating an index to go along with that as well. Notice the down just drops the two tables, and all the indexes that belong to the tables get dropped along with it. Okay, so we're ready to update the database with our changes for many to many. So I'll just bring back that last command. I don't need a name, come to think of it. I just need to change that to update database. That should probably be close enough. I can hit tab and complete the name. Update database, right? Just for my context. And there it goes. So if you're really curious, you can go back and look at all the X SQL here. It's logged out to the output window. And we can see all the SQL that was executed to bring the database in line. All right. So I now have the plumbing all in place in the database and my models to support this many to many. Okay. Any questions about that so far? Just a little bit more work I want to do on this at this point in time. Uh, obviously, it's good to have a table, but right now there's no data in it. Now we could go in and create controllers and manually add some data and so on. But you know, we do already have our class set up right here under the data namespace or data folder, our medical office seed data. Well, we can seed data into these new entities just as well. Just be a little bit careful about the order, right? Obviously, when it comes to that new intersection table between patient and condition, we can't put data in there until after we already have data in both patient and condition, right? So if I want, I could let it finish creating the patient. Okay, that's fine. And then I'll come down here underneath that. And let's add data for our new condition. Conditions, okay? Now this will take the exact same structure just to save some time. I do have it baked and ready to go. Right, so here's my conditions. I'll just copy this bit of code. code. Well, I guess I have the comment in there twice, so I'll just take it out there. So conditions. So I don't know. I did this when I was making up the other night. I thought cancer, heart attack, diabetes. <laughs> Maybe me. How do you spell measles? S e l s. M e a s. L e s. Thank you. And I want to add one more. I want to add another condition. Uh, for mumps. M-U-M-P-S, do I have that right? No one's complaining, okay. <laughs> All right, so I got a few different conditions here now. Mumps, heart attack, measles, etc. right? Add a few more if you want, but you know, you can always add them later on. We will obviously set up a, a controller and views to maintain the conditions themselves. Okay, so that's all it takes. It's just like any other entity. So the last one's a little bit more interesting, though. We want to actually add code so that we can... Uh, oh, sorry. Don't want to do it here. I want to do it 
here. We're going to, I'll copy paste my code, I guess. Nothing behind the curtain. It's all right here for you too. So I'm just adding a few records, right? Later on, we're gonna to add to the interface so we can maintain this data ourselves. Okay, but I just thought I'd throw a few in. So here, right, our patient conditions, well, it's that intersection between, so I just make sure it's empty first, then I'm gonna add a range. Now remember, a patient condition, all it really has is those two integers, the two foreign keys, right? So to make sure I have proper values though, we're gonna take that approach we talked about before of essentially using a link query to go and grab okay, a record that matches values that should be here, right? So I have a condition named cancer and so on and so forth. Ah, now I changed diabetes, so that would, that would be a problem. So I'll change that to measles. Okay. So I'm just giving, uh, in, in this case, Fred Flintstone two conditions, cancer and a heart attack. And Wilma Flintstone has a record of, she had measles once, okay? I'm just giving a little bit of data. Uh, the big job, of course, will be modifying the user interface with checkboxes and so on, so that we can actually uh, maintain this. But at least for now, we can show a little bit, right? Okay, speaking of showing, that's the last thing I'll do. I'm gonna close this now. This should run next time we run, right? And it'll actually populate the seed data as we execute the application. But where would that show up, right? Where would we want it to show up? What I was thought, my first thought is, well, right on the patient index, why don't we add a medical history column? Well, I don't wanna clutter this page with too many columns, we've talked about that. But, you know, we kind of mentioned the other day that, eh, you know, that email column, maybe that really should be more private on the details view as well. We don't need to see that on the index view. So I'm gonna replace that column with the one to show the medical history, right? So I'm just gonna, actually, I don't need to even, I'll just change it, right? So let me bring up the patient index. So I'll come over here to views, find patient, bring up the index view, right? So down here where I had email, well, I now have, and IntelliSense should give it to me, patient conditions. Oh, it just hasn't caught up yet. But if it doesn't complain, then when I ask it to look for it, it says, oh yeah, I see that there now, right? Now here's where that display name, remember I gave it a display name when I added that property to the uh, model class for a patient? I can just call it history, right? So it'll use that name as the column name at the top. So that's the display name that I created for my eye collection of patient conditions inside the patient. Okay, now let's come down here. Here, this email, eh, I'm gonna get rid of that altogether. And here is where I want to put in some code to show. But the thing is, it, it's a whole collection, right? I'm going to have multiple conditions to list here, possibly. So whenever you have a collection, you need a loop. Loopy loopy, right? We've got to get a little loopy sometimes. And I don't mean on just on Friday night. Okay. So let me come back over here. What we're going to do is I'm going to throw in a for each loop. Now this is razor syntax. So you've done that tutorial on razors. So you have no problem with this, right? <coughs> Right? Yeah? Okay. So in razor syntax, I just use the at symbol and then I can start writing C sharp code. Okay? So each var C and item, remember the item as I loop through this loop is each patient, patient conditions. Okay? And then what I'll do is I'll just put the condition, dot condition name. Because remember, the patient conditions, okay? Uh, gives me the access to the condition, but then it's actually the condition name property of the condition class that I want to display. And then I can just add a BR tag there at the end, so it'll just put a line break, basically listing all the conditions on the screen. Right? Now, let's see if this even works. Should seed... Go to patients, bring up the index. Ah, okay. It says, wait a second, there's a null here. I have a null reference exception. Well, for one thing, we didn't initialize that collection to anything, did we, right? 
but you know, we if we even if I had, it wouldn't have worked. So what we need to do is we need to eagerly load, eagerly load, the uh, data into that collection, right? We need to eagerly load. So when we do the link query to go and get the patient data, we say also grab the data from the uh, uh, patient conditions collection, right? That's called eager loading because instead of going back after the fact to the database to get it, we're going to act, ask for it up front. So we're eager to get it so we can get it all in one trip to the database as opposed to going back over and over again. Okay? So that is done with a little bit of work inside of our controller. So if I come up to the controllers, open up the patient's controller. Okay, right now we have a very simple link query here. Right. That's a bad name. I, I fixed that once. Were you with me when I fixed? I don't know why the scaffolding gave it that name for the variable. I, I should call it uh, patience. Okay. And then call it patience here. That's something. It, oh. Something weird in the scaffolding that it used the name of the context there. Anyway, so here's our link query. I'm just going to create a I queryable, okay, uh, of our context, the patient's DB set. And notice it already has one include. So it's saying, okay, give me the doctor. That's why we have things like the doctor's full name and so on available inside the view, is we're already including or eagerly loading when we materialize a patient object, we're saying also give me the doctor object, the, the property inside the patient. Well, but we want to include even more. So I can press enter here. Remember, you can break this up on multiple lines because it is C sharp. Besides including the doctor, I can say, well, guess what else? I want to include P goes to P dot patient conditions, right? That is okay, the I collection that we added as a property inside of patient. Okay, But of course that always gives us is the foreign key values. That's the only thing stored in here, right? So fortunately with .NET Core they've allowed us to walk across the bridge, right? The bridge between the two many to many. So we can include, first we have to stop at the intersection table but we can keep on going with then include. Then include allows us right, to keep on adding or walking across the bridge as I put it of the relationship. Oh, oh I have to use a different letter here because I'm uh, Right? It's not longer the P, it's the patient conditions condition. Wait a second, what have I done? Wait a second. Dee, dee, dee. Then include, P. yeah, condition. Okay, it just didn't, uh, again, the IntelliSense was running a little behind there. All right. So now, it will, when it materializes each patient, it'll grab the doctor. So the doctor object is initialized with the actual doctor. Uh, it'll grab the collection of patient conditions, and each patient condition, it will also populate with its corresponding condition. Right. Remember, inside patient conditions, we actually had the two vert well they aren't virtual anymore the two objects right the condition object was there as well as the uh, patient object okay so this will eagerly load everything that we need so that it should properly display now and drum roll please go to patients and I don't see anything <laughs> okay maybe it didn't see all right, so I could, oh. Okay, so I found my boo-boo, my little error. It was just a copy-paste error. 
essentially what I needed right here was a curvy brace and I accidentally put it in the wrong spot. So I can just add that one back in. Mind you, that gives me one too many. So I'll, if I take one out down here, now you might say, wait a second, now your indentation's all messed up and everything, and you'd be absolutely right, okay? However, if you hadn't noticed before, I can always go edit, down to advanced, and there's format document. So it fixes all your little indentation, and the lining up of all your curly braces and everything. Contri uh, control K, control D is a keyboard shortcut. If you're really good at remembering all of those, then that's a good one to know. And there we go. So now it's fixed up the indentation. So you brought the section back out in line with this dotted line. And away we go. So now it should work properly. It was just a copy paste there. So it never actually ran uh, the uh, seed data. And go to patience and yay. So I'm seeing the history as recorded in our seed data here. Right. So we're going to leave off this discussion for now because it was basically the ability to create these many-to-many -many relationships is required for the next bit of homework, right? But we will come back to this because we want, obviously, when we create an edit, we want to be able to specify, okay, what conditions is in the medical history of the patient, right? But to save time for now, we'll leave that to a later lecture. Any final questions on many-to-many? -many? Okay.